drowns with an image. Nathaniel Hawthorne. One sunshiny morning, in the good old times of the town of Boston, a young carver inward, well known by the name of Drown, stood contemplating a large oaken log, which it was his purpose to convert into the figurehead of a vessel. And while he discussed within his own mind what sort of shape or similitude it were well to bestow upon this excellent piece of timber, there came into Drown's workshop a certain Captain Hunnell, owner and commander of the good brig called the Sinisure, which had just returned from her first voyage to file. Ah! That will do, Drown, that will do! cried the jolly captain, tapping the log with his rattan. I bespeak this very piece of oak for the figurehead of the Sinisure. She has shown herself the sweetest craft that ever floated, and I mean to decorate her prow with the handsomest image that the skill of man can cut out of timber. And, Drown, you are the fellow to execute it. You give me more credit than I deserve, Captain Hunnell, said the carver, modestly, yet as one conscious of eminence in his art. But, for the sake of the good brig, I stand ready to do my best. And which of these designs do you prefer? Here, pointing to a staring, half-length figure, in a white wig and scarlet coat comma here is an excellent model, the likeness of our gracious king. Here is the valiant Admiral Vernon. Or, if you prefer a female figure, what say you to Britannia with the trident? All very fine, drown, all very fine, answered the mariner. But as nothing like the brig ever swam the ocean, so I am determined she shall have such a figure as old Neptune never saw in his life. And what is more, as there is a secret in the matter, you must pledge your credit not to betray it. Certainly, said Drown, marvelling, however, what possible mystery there could be in reference to an affair so open, of necessity, to the inspection of all the world as the figurehead of a vessel. You may depend, Captain, on my being as secret as the nature of the case will permit. Captain Hunnell then took Drown by the button, and communicated his wishes in so low a tone that it would be unmannerly to repeat what was evidently intended for the carver's private ear. We shall, therefore, take the opportunity to give the reader a few desirable particulars about Drown himself. He was the first American who is known to have attempted in a very humble line. It is true that art in which we can now reckon so many names already distinguished, or rising to distinction. From his earliest boyhood he had exhibited an act for it would be too proud a word to call it genius an act, therefore, for the imitation of the human figure in whatever material came most readily to hand. The snows of a New England winter had often supplied him with a species of marble as dazzlingly white, at least, as the Parian or the Carrara, and if less durable yet sufficiently so to correspond with any claims to permanent existence possessed by the boy's frozen statues. Yet they won admiration from mature judges than his schoolfellows, and were indeed, remarkably clever, though destitute of the native warmth that might have made the snow melt beneath his hand. As he advanced in life, the young man adopted pine and oak as eligible materials for the display of his skill which now began to bring him a return of solid silver as well as the empty praise that had been an apartment reward enough for his productions of evanescent snow. He became noted for carving ornamental pump heads, and wooden urns for gate posts, and decorations, more grotesque than fanciful, for mantelpieces. No apothecary would have deemed himself in the way of obtaining custom without setting up a gilded mortar, if not a head of Galen or Hippocrates, from the skillful hand of Drown. But the great scope of his business lay in the manufacture of figureheads for vessels. Whether it were the monarch himself, or some famous British admiral or general, or the governor of the province, or perchance the favourite daughter of the ship owner, there the image stood above the prow, decked out in gorgeous colours, magnificently gilded, and staring the whole world out of countenance, as if from an innate consciousness of its own superiority. These specimens of native sculpture had crossed the sea in all directions, and been not ignobly noticed among the crowded shipping of the Thames and wherever else the hardy mariners of New England had pushed their adventures. It must be confessed that a family likeness pervaded these respectable progeny of Drown's skill, that the benign countenance of the king resembled those of his subjects, and that Miss Becky Hobart, the merchant's daughter, bore a remarkable similitude to Britannia, Victory, and other ladies of the allegoric sisterhood, and, finally, that they all had a kind of wooden aspect which proved an intimate relationship with the unshaped blocks of timber in the carver's workshop. 
but at least there was no inconsiderable skill of hand, nor a deficiency of any attribute to render them really works of art, except that deep quality, be it of soul or intellect, which bestows life upon the lifeless and warmth upon the cold, and which, had it been present, would have made Drown's wooden image instinct with spirit. The captain of the Sinosure had now finished his instructions. And Drown, said he, impressively, you must lay aside all other business and set about this forthwith. And as to the price, only do the job in first-rate style, and you shall settle that point yourself. Very well, Captain, answered the carver, who looked grave and somewhat perplexed, yet had a sort of smile upon his visage, depend upon it, I'll do my utmost to satisfy you. From that moment the men of taste about Long Wharf and the town dock who were wont to show their love for the arts by frequent visits to Drown's workshop, and admiration of his wooden images, began to be sensible of a mystery in the carver's conduct. Often he was absent in the daytime. Sometimes, as might be judged by gleams of light from the shop windows, he was at work until a late hour of the evening, although neither knock nor voice, on such occasions, could gain admittance for a visitor or elicit any word of response. Nothing remarkable, however, was observed in the shop at those late hours when it was thrown open. A fine piece of timber, indeed, which Drown was known to have reserved for some work of especial dignity, was seen to be gradually assuming shape. What shape it was destined ultimately to take was a problem to his friends and a point on which the carver himself preserved a rigid silence. But day after day, though Drown was seldom noticed in the act of working upon it, this rude form began to be developed until it became evident to all observers that a female figure was growing into mimic life. At each new visit they beheld a larger pile of wooden chips and a nearer approximation to something beautiful. It seemed as if the hammer-dryad of the oak had sheltered herself from the unimaginative world within the heart of her native tree, and that it was only necessary to remove the strange shapelessness that had encrusted her, and reveal the grace and loveliness of a divinity. Imperfect as the design, the attitude, the costume, and especially the face of the image still remained, there was already an effect that drew the eye from the wooden cleverness of Drown's earlier productions and fixed it upon the tantalizing mystery of this new project. Copley, the celebrated painter, then a young man and a resident of Boston, came one day to visit Drown, for he had recognized so much of moderate ability in the carver as to induce him in the dearth of professional sympathy, to cultivate his acquaintance. On entering the shop, the artist glanced at the inflexible image of King, Commander, Dame, and Allegory, that stood round, on the best of which might have been bestowed the questionable praise that it looked as if a living man had here been changed to wood, and that not only the physical, but the intellectual and spiritual part, partook of the stolid transformation. But in not a single instance did it seem as if the wood were imbibing the ethereal essence of humanity. What a wide distinction is here! And how far the slightest portion of the latter merit have outvalued the utmost degree of the former! My friend Drown, said Copley, smiling to himself, but alluding to the mechanical and wooden cleverness that so invariably distinguished the images, you are really a remarkable person. I have seldom met with a man in your line of business that could do so much for one other touch might make this figure of General Wolfe, for instance, a breathing and intelligent human creature. You would have me think that you are praising me highly, Mr. Copley, answered Drown, turning his back upon Wolfe's image in apparent disgust. But there has come a light into my mind. I know what you know as well, that the one touch which you speak of as deficient is the only one that would be truly valuable, and that without it these works of mine are no better than worthless abortions. There is the same difference between them and the works of an inspired artist as between a signpost daub and one of your best pictures. This is strange, cried Copley, looking him in the face, which now, as the painter fancied, had a singular depth of intelligence, though hitherto it had not given him greatly the advantage over his own family of wooden images. What has come over you? How is it that, possessing the idea which you have now uttered, you should produce only such works as these? The carver smiled, but made no reply. Copley turned again to the images, conceiving that the sense of deficiency which Drown had just expressed, and which is so rare in a merely mechanical character, must surely imply a genius, the tokens of which had heretofore been overlooked. But no, there was not a trace of it. 
He was about to withdraw when his eyes chanced to fall upon a half-developed figure which lay in a corner of the workshop, surrounded by scattered chips of oak. It arrested him at once. What is here? Who has done this? He broke out, after contemplating it in speechless astonishment for an instant. Here is the divine, the life-giving touch. What inspired hand is beckoning this wood to arise and live? Whose work is this? No man's work, replied Drown. The figure lies within that block of oak, and it is my business to find it. Drown, said the true artist, grasping the carver fervently by the hand, you are a man of genius. As Copley departed, happening to glance backward from the threshold, he beheld Drown bending over the half-created shape, and stretching forth his arms as if he would have embraced and drawn it to his heart, while, had such a miracle been possible, his countenance expressed passion enough to communicate warmth and sensibility to the lifeless oak. Strange enough, said the artist to himself, who would have looked for a modern Pygmalion in the person of a Yankee mechanic. As yet, the image was but vague in its outward presentment, so that, as in the cloud shapes around the western sun, the observer either felt, or was led to imagine, then really saw what was intended by it. Day by day, however, the work assumed greater precision, and settled its irregular and misty outline into distincter grace and beauty. The general design was now obvious to the common eye. It was a female figure, in what appeared to be a foreign dress, the gown being laced over the bosom, and opening in front so as to disclose a skirt or petticoat the folds and inequalities of which were admirably represented in the oaken substance. She wore a hat of singular gracefulness, and abundantly laden with flowers, such as never grew in the rude soil of New England, but which, with all their fanciful luxuriance, had a natural truth that it seemed impossible for the most fertile imagination to have attained without copying from real prototypes. There were several little appendages to this dress, such as a fan, a pair of earrings, a chain about the neck a watch in the bosom, and a ring upon the finger, all of which would have been deemed beneath the dignity of sculpture. They were put on, however, with as much taste as a lovely woman might have shown in her attire, and could therefore have shocked none but a judgment spoiled by artistic rules. The face was still imperfect, but gradually, by a magic touch, intelligence and sensibility brightened through the features, with all the effect of light gleaming forth from within the solid oak the face became alive. It was a beautiful, though not precisely regular and somewhat haughty aspect, but with a certain piquancy about the eyes and mouth, which, of all expressions, would have seemed the most impossible to throw over a wooden countenance. And now, so far as carving went, this wonderful production was complete. Drown, said Copley, who had hardly missed a single day in his visits to the carver's workshop, if this work were in marble it would make you famous at once. Nay, I would almost affirm that it would make a nearer in the art. It is as ideal as an antique statue, and yet as real as any lovely woman whom one meets at a fireside or in the street. But I trust you do not mean to desecrate this exquisite creature with paint, like those staring kings and admirals yonder? Not paint her! exclaimed Captain Hunnell, who stood by, not paint the figurehead of Sinisure. And what sort of a figure should I cut in a foreign port with such an unpainted oaken stick as this over my prow? She must, and she shall, be painted to the life, from the topmost flower in her hat down to the silver spangles on her slippers. Mr. Copley, said Drown, quietly, I know nothing of marble statuary, and nothing of the sculptor's rules of art, but of this wooden image, this work of my hands, this creature of my heart and here his voice faltered and choked in a very singular manner comma of this of her I may say that I know something. A wellspring of inward wisdom gushed within me as I wrought upon the oak with my whole strength, and soul, and faith. Let others do what they may with marble, and adopt what rules they choose. If I can produce my desired effect by painted wood, those rules are not for me, and I have a right to disregard them. The very spirit of genius, muttered Copley to himself. How otherwise should this carver feel himself entitled to transcend all rules, and make me ashamed of quoting them? He looked earnestly at Drown, and again saw that expression of human love which, in a spiritual sense, as the artist could not help imagining, was the secret of the life that had been breathed into this block of wood. The carver, still
still in the same secrecy that marked all his operations upon this mysterious image, proceeded to paint the habiliments in their proper colors, and the countenance with nature's red and white. When all was finished he threw open his workshop, and admitted the townspeople to behold what he had done. Most persons, at their first entrance, felt impelled to remove their hats, and pay such reverence as was due to the richly dressed and beautiful young lady who seemed to stand in a corner of the room, with oaken chips and shavings scattered at her feet. Then came a sensation of fear, as if, not being actually human, yet so like humanity, she must therefore be something preternatural. There was, in truth, an indefinable air and expression that might reasonably induce the query, who and from what sphere this daughter of the oak should be. The strange, rich flowers of Eden on her head, the complexion, so much deeper and more brilliant than those of our native beauties, the foreign, as it seemed, and fantastic garb, yet not too fantastic to be worn decorously in the street, the delicately wrought embroidery of the skirt, the broad gold chain about her neck, the curious ring upon her finger, the fan, so exquisitely sculptured in open work, and painted to resemble pearl and ebony semicolon work of drown, in his sober walk of life, had beheld the vision here so matchlessly embodied. And then her face. In the dark eyes, and around the voluptuous mouth, the played a look made up of pride, coquetry, and a gleam of mirthfulness which impressed Copley with the idea that the image was secretly enjoying the perplexing admiration of himself and other beholders. And will you, said he to the carver, permit this masterpiece to become the figurehead of a vessel? Give the honest captain yonder figure of Britannia it will answer his purpose far better and send this fairy queen to England, where, for aught I know, it may bring you a thousand pounds. I have not wrought it for money, said Drown. What sort of a fellow is this? thought Copley. A Yankee, and throw away the chance of making his fortune. He has gone mad, and thence has come this gleam of genius. There was still further proof of Drown's lunacy, if credit were due to the rumor that he had been seen kneeling at the feet of the oaken lady, and gazing with a lover's passionate ardor into the face that his own hands had created. The bigots of the day hinted that it would be no matter of surprise if an evil spirit were allowed to enter this beautiful form and seduced the carver to destruction. The fame of the image spread far and wide. The inhabitants visited it so universally, that after a few days of exhibition there was hardly an old man or a child who had not become minutely familiar with its aspect. Even had the story of Drown's wooden image ended here, its celebrity might have been prolonged for many years by the reminiscences of those who looked upon it in their childhood, and saw nothing else so beautiful in afterlife. But the town was now astounded by an event, the narrative of which has formed itself into one of the most singular legends that are yet to be met within the traditionary chimney corners of the New England metropolis, where old men and women sit dreaming of the past, and wag their heads at the dreamers of the present and the future. One fine morning, just before the departure of the cynosure on her second voyage to file, the commander of that gallant vessel was seen to issue from his residence in Hanover Street. He was stylishly dressed in a blue broadcloth coat, with gold lace at the seams and buttonholes, an embroidered scarlet waistcoat, a triangular hat, with a loop and broad binding of gold, and wore a silver hilted hanger at his side. But the good captain might have been arrayed in the robes of a prince or the rags of a beggar, without in either case attracting notice, while obscured by such a companion as now leaned on his arm. The people in the street started, rubbed their eyes and either leapt aside from their path, or stood as if transfixed to wood or marble in astonishment. Do you see it question mark do you see it? cried one, with tremulous eagerness. It is the very same. The same? answered another, who had arrived in town only the night before. Who do you mean? I see only a sea captain in his shore-going clothes, and a young lady in a foreign habit, with a bunch of beautiful flowers in her hat. On my word, she is as fair and bright a damsel as my eyes have looked on this many a day. Yes, the same exclamation mark the very same. Repeated the other. Drown's wooden image has come to life. Here was a miracle indeed. Yet, illuminated by the sunshine, or darkened by the alternate shade of the houses, and with its garments fluttering lightly in the morning breeze, there passed the image along the street. It was exactly and minutely the shape, the garb, and the face which the townspeople had so recently thronged to see and admire. 
not a rich flower upon her head, not a single leaf, but had had its prototype in Drown's wooden workmanship, although now their fragile grace had become flexible, and was shaken by every footstep that the wearer made. The broad gold chain upon the neck was identical with the one represented on the image, and glistened with the motion imparted by the rise and fall of the bosom which it decorated. A real diamond sparkled on her finger. In her right hand she bore a pearl and ebony fan, which she flourished with a fantastic and bewitching coquetry, that was likewise expressed in all her movements as well as in the style of her beauty and the attire that so well harmonized with it. The face with its brilliant depth of complexion had the same piquancy of mirthful mischief that was fixed upon the countenance of the image, but which was here varied and continually shifting, yet always essentially the same, like the sunny gleam upon a bubbling fountain. On the whole, there was something so airy and yet so real in the figure, and withal so perfectly did it represent Drown's image, that people knew not whether to suppose the magic would etherealized into a spirit or warmed and softened into an actual woman. One thing is certain, muttered a Puritan of the old stamp, Drown has sold himself to the devil, and doubtless this gay Captain Hannah is a party to the bargain. And I, said a young man who overheard him, would almost consent to be the third victim, for the liberty of saluting those lovely lips. And so would I, said Copley, the painter, for the privilege of taking her picture. The image, or the apparition, whichever it might be, still escorted by the bold captain, proceeded from Hanover Street through some of the cross lanes that make this portion of the town so intricate, to Anne Street, thence into Dock Square, and so downward to Drand's shop, which stood just on the water's edge. The crowd still followed, gathering volume as it rolled along. Never had a modern miracle occurred in such broad daylight, nor in the presence of such a multitude of witnesses. The airy image, as if conscious that she was the object of the murmurs and disturbance that swelled behind her, appeared slightly vexed and flustered, yet still in a manner consistent with the light vivacity and sportive mischief that were written in her countenance. She was observed to flutter her fan with such vehement rapidity that the elaborate delicacy of its workmanship gave way, and it remained broken in her hand. Arriving at Drown's door, while the captain threw it open, the marvellous apparition paused an instant on the threshold, assuming the very attitude of the image, and casting over the crowd that glance of sunny coquetry which all remembered on the face of the oaken lady. She and her cavalier then disappeared. Ah! murmured the crowd drawing a deep breath, as with one vast pair of lungs. The world looks dark now that she has vanished, said some of the young men. But the aged, whose recollections dated as far back as which times, shook their heads, and hinted that our forefathers would have thought it a pious deed to burn the daughter of the oak with fire. If she be other than a bubble of the elements, exclaimed Copley, I must look upon her face again. He accordingly entered the shop, and there, in her usual corner, stood the image, gazing at him, as it might seem, with the very same expression of mirthful mischief that had been the farewell look of the apparition when, but a moment before, she turned her face towards the crowd. The carver stood beside his creation mending the beautiful fan, which by some accident was broken in her hand. But there was no longer any motion in the lifelike image, nor any real woman in the workshop, nor even the witchcraft of a sunny shadow that might have deluded people's eyes as it flitted along the street. Captain Hunnell, too, had vanished. His hoarse sea breezy tones, however, were audible on the other side of a door that opened upon the water. Sit down in the stern sheets, my lady, said the gallant captain. Come, bear a hand, you lubbers, and set us on board in the turning of a minute glass. And then was heard the stroke of oars. Drown, said Copley with a smile of intelligence. You have been a truly fortunate man. What painter or statuary ever had such a subject? No wonder that she inspired a genius into you, and first created the artist who afterwards created her image. Drown looked at him with a visage that bore the traces of tears, but from which the light of imagination and sensibility, so recently illuminating it, had departed. He was again the mechanical carver that he had been known to be all his lifetime. I hardly understand what you mean. Mr. Copley, said he, putting his hand to his brow. This image. Can it have been my work? Well, I have wrought it in a kind of dream, and now that I am broad awake I must set about finishing yonder figure of Admiral Vernon.
and forthwith he employed himself on the stolid countenance of one of his wooden progeny, and completed it in his own mechanical style, from which he was never known afterwards to deviate. He followed his business industriously for many years, acquired a competence, and in the latter part of his life attained to a dignified station in the church, being remembered in records and traditions as Deacon Drown, the carver. One of his productions, an Indian chief, gilded all over, stood during the better part of a century on the cupola of the province house, bedazzling the eyes of those who looked upward, like an angel of the sun. Another work of the good deacon's hand a reduced likeness of his friend Captain Hunnell, holding a telescope and quadrant may be seen to this day, at the corner of Broad and State Streets, serving in the useful capacity of sign to the shop of a nautical instrument maker. We know not how to account for the inferiority of this quaint old figure, as compared with the recorded excellence of the oaken lady, unless on the supposition that in every human spirit there is imagination, sensibility, creative power, genius, which, according to circumstances, may either be developed in this world, or shrouded in a mask of dullness until another state of being. To our friend Drown there came a brief season of excitement, kindled by love. It rendered him a genius for that one occasion, but, quenched in disappointment, left him again the mechanical carver inward, without the power even of appreciating the work that his own hands had wrought. Yet who can doubt that the very highest state to which a human spirit can attain, in its loftiest aspirations, is its truest and the most natural state, and that Drown was more consistent with himself when he wrought the admirable figure of the mysterious lady, than when he perpetrated a whole progeny of blockheads. There was a rumor in Boston, about this period, that a young Portuguese lady of rank, on some occasion of political or domestic disquietude, had fled from her home in file and put herself under the protection of Captain Hunnell, on board of whose vessel, and at whose residence, she was sheltered until a change of affairs. This fair stranger must have been the original of Drown's wooden image, 